Welcome to Yes Catholic, the place where real people share their real stories and realize it is all God's grace on the move. I'm your host, David Patterson, and every week we hear a new guest share their story of how they came to give their yes to Jesus and his church. So let's get started. And there we go. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your story tonight. Really looking forward to it. My pleasure. My pleasure. Awesome. So for those who don't know you, why don't you share a little bit about yourself before we dive into the rapid fire? Yeah, yeah, sure. So my name's Michael Sands. I come from Oxfordshire in England, which is about an hour from London. I work for the government, but I trained as a pianist. So I work uh, or offer my services to the church through music now. So I'm involved in music ministry. Uh, I love to travel. Most people who know me lo- know about my love of tea and coffee. <laughs> I'm always seen with a tea or coffee in my hand, as you well know, David. That's um, right. And I'm a Catholic convert, so I'm a convert to the church. And how old were you when you, you converted? We're going to learn more soon. but uh, uh, I guess about 21. Okay. I think I was about 21. Yeah. So. Very cool. Solid intro, man. Well, we're going to get to know you a little bit more with the rapid fire, and then we'll, uh, we'll get you to share your story. You ready to go? Absolutely. All right. Favorite place to visit? Um, oh, there are so many. Um, one of the places I really loved was a place called La Malbe in Quebec. Uh, that was just stunning. So I guess Canada would be well up there on my list. Canada, eh? Represent. I mean, Toronto, Toronto over here. Okay. How would you describe yourself as a kid in three words? Um, shy, okay. reserved, but determined. Determined as well. Cool. Okay. Uh, go to short prayer. It's got to be the Hail Mary. Hail Mary. Mary yeah yeah powerful prayer for sure okay who inspires you uh many many people i think for me pope benedict uh would be very high on that list because he was the pope when i was uh received into the church Mm. and i was inspired by his amazing teachings from day one so i think i would have to say pope benedict definitely yeah yeah he's he's definitely got an amazing writings but so deep too i remember when i was doing my masters I, like i had to read his book a couple of times just to be like starting to grasp yeah how I deep think, his yeah. stuff is right okay if you could have coffee with any saint or tea right uh who would it be saint cecilia because we'd have a lot to talk about with music so um right 100 yeah, definitely saint cecilia for me very cool very cool okay last one if you could ask god one question what would it be Um, I think I would ask him how he would like me to evangelize mm. because, you know, when, when you're a lay person, like, uh, I am, and I'm not in ministry, or I don't even have a ministry like you do. Um, it's difficult to know how to, how to share the gospel with people and how to bring it to people's lives that we come into contact with. So, yeah, I think yeah. I would ask God how he would like me in my position to evangelize better that's that's a good question man i think a lot of people uh are in a similar boat you know just kind of yeah. wondering the same thing so all right well let's kick things off with an opening prayer and i'll get to share your story in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit amen hail mary full of grace the lord is with thee blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb jesus holy mary mother of god pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death amen St. Cecilia, please pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, man, let's dive right in. Where's your story begin? Just like that. <laughs> wow, so it's, it's just so scary. Um, You're good. Okay. My story begins um, really with the fact that I was raised in a very religious, faith-filled family. So I was very, very blessed. Uh, my great-grandfather had been a pastor in the kind of revival style. Uh, a great preacher and his daughter, my grandmother, told me all those stories growing up and I always had a real interest in it. So faith was something that was important to me really from the word go. And some of my happiest memories are spent with my grandmother um, at church and she would pray with me and she uh, passed on those notebooks that belonged to her father um, for me. And she said to me, out of all her grandchildren, she said, you're the one that has the visible faith and it it wasn't that she was putting me higher than them but she just said you're the one who's really interested in this and so Mm. she gave me those um kind of heirlooms 
so that she could enjoy seeing them passed on, which really uh, touched me at the time. And she was such an inspirational person to me um, that faith was, was something that I had a real zest for um, at quite a young age. Um, I never minded going to church, you know, like a lot of kids sometimes find it boring, whatever. And I guess I went through that at one point, but yeah. generally I liked church, I was into it. Um, so I was very blessed. I had a really great start um, in a very faith-filled family. Um, what happened was, here in England, there are two schools. Um, so we have primary school, which is the equivalent to elementary, and then secondary, which is like a blend of what would be, I guess, high school, and is it junior high? I don't, I don't know. So there are two schools. And most elementary schools in England belong to a church, which of course is Protestant. And I should have added that I was raised Protestant. I was raised as what's called C of E, so Church of England, otherwise known as Anglican. Okay. So the elementary school I went to, along with my siblings, was Anglican, as 99% are. And so it was a very religious school, and we had church services, and a vicar would come in and lead this service. So it was a very uh, faith environment. And my parents wanted all of their children to have a religious experience at secondary school, so and the kind of teenage years. Now, here in this country, secondary schools are not affiliated with a church, so they're just kind of like state operators. Um, okay. by the counties yeah. um, and it was during a child's conversation my mum had with a lady in our village once and she was saying oh I'm really worried you know about sending my children to a non-faith school and this woman said well hang on a minute you're Church of England why don't you send them to the Catholic school because you know Catholicism is very similar mm -hmm. and so my parents um, went to see the Monsignor at the local Catholic church and asked him if we could all go to the Catholic school. And this Monsignor said, yes, of course, your children are welcome to come here, but you do understand they will be taught Catholic doctrine. Um, to which my parents said, oh, don't you worry, they'll be following the rules and they will obey. Because I was yeah. raised old school, we wouldn't have dared play, um, to bring embarrassment in any way. Yeah. So off to Catholic school I went. Um, and that was my first introduction to Catholicism. And I've okay. got to be honest, if I could see the CCTV footage of me when I first rocked up there, <laughs> I would laugh. I mean, as a Protestant kid, I knew nothing about Catholicism. I mean, to give an example, I didn't know what genuflecting was. I didn't right. know what Hail Mary was. I didn't know what the Angelus was. I yeah. knew nothing. <laughs> um, and I was one of six, and there were six Protestant kids in a school of like 800 kids so um it, it was wow. really daunting to start with but i was interested and i'd always been taught that by my parents that obviously our church originated with catholicism so i was fascinated by it mm. so i was at the school obviously for five years and that was my kind of first introduction to it but during that time my problems really started now i was so different to the other kids i always tell people if you've seen a kind of typical American teen movie where there's the class loser, that was me in every way. I mean, I was the short, fat, ugly type. I wasn't physically popular. I wasn't funny. I wasn't good at sport. I wasn't confident. I was reserved. I was shy. I wasn't academic. I mean, there was no saving grace at all. And um, I wasn't, I've got to say, I wasn't really badly bullied. It wasn't like I was being beaten up in corridors every day. but. I was certainly aware that other kids found me very different. Uh, I didn't fit in. And it was a really negative time. And I th think looking back now, and I think it happens with quite a few people, I think it kind of triggered a series of events which was a bad place to be. I had right. no confidence, no self-esteem. I was full of kind of this bizarre sense of shame that I couldn't be normal. Um, and it made interactions very difficult for me. I dreaded social events. And that was really the foundation, unfortunately, that I entered my adult years. I think at that time in your life, for a lot of people, it is it is a time that can be difficult for many reasons. But, you know, kids are not backwards in coming forwards in letting you know if you're different. And so, you know, certainly with guys, I mean, they're quite egotistical at times. And so if you're not good at sports and girls don't like you, then they, they're going to let you know that. And they certainly did with me. So mm -hmm. when I left school, I didn't 
have a very high opinion of my capabilities. I didn't think that I was going to achieve or do anything. I, I didn't know what the point of my life was. I didn't know where it was going to go. I remember looking out and thinking my life was just a blank canvas. And that was a really crushing mentality to have. And um, because the, all the experiences I'd had growing up were, were, were kind of tainted by that experience at school. Um, so it kind of taught me that I was different. It, was, it taught me that I wasn't going to be capable of anything. And uh, I carried that with me into my early adult life. And so I left school and got a job. And that was, I mean, it was good because it was, you know, kind of earning some money and I had the independence element and, and, it, was, and it was good. But I looked out at my friends and my, you know, the people I knew and all of them were doing these amazing things. You know, they were going to college, they were starting to date, they were traveling the world, whatever it was. And I just, I used to just look out and think, wow, I want all that, you know, but I just knew I couldn't do it. And I went on like that for quite some time. And it was, it, I mean, it just spiraled. I was really bad with any form of interaction because I felt so different. And I sort of felt so much shame about it. Um, just this chronic feeling of shame and guilt and, and fear and everything. And then one day, I'd always played the piano uh, and I'd always enjoyed music. It was my passion. How old, how old did you start playing the piano? I was six. Six years old. Okay. Yeah, I was six when I... Well, I should say I was six when I started official piano lessons, but I was right. always playing. From My mother said, even as a baby, if music was playing anywhere, I would just stop everything and just, wow. until the music finished, and then I would carry on. So it was there in me from day one. Wow. But, um, yeah, so these uh, theatre producers contacted me and somehow had seen some work I'd done, and they said, we really want you to come and be one of the acts in a theatre production and my initial thing because at this point obviously I was the idea of any form of social interaction was terrifying to me and so I thought I can't do this like you know what are they crazy I'm just freak Michael I, I couldn't do that but at the same time something in me thought well what's the worst that's going to happen mm. I was used to people laughing at me I was used to people criticizing me so I thought well I'll do it you know it'll probably go wrong I'll embarrass myself, but hey ho, that's that's like. So I went to this piano concert, and it was. I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but it was very successful, and it took me by surprise. And of course, the producers loved it because I was selling all the tickets. It was my act that was the one that was the highest seller. Wow! And so, of course, they immediately said, "We want to book you for a whole run of." performances we talk about the humbled being exalted man yeah <laughs> too, too kind i mean it was it was i mean it was awesome at the time and i tell you the real reason at that at that point and i say at that point was that it gave me this some kind of you know when i when i, I was I, I i should have gone but i'll go back a little bit sure. first just to say when i left school and i was working because I felt so empty and worthless and useless, like my life meant nothing, I made the classic mistake of trying to find value in the world. And so I would do everything from, you know, take a nicer vacation, have a nicer car, nicer clothes. I would try to, to have something to make myself feel better or valuable yeah. or whatever. And I'd been yeah. taught that that was wrong. And I knew it, it I, on an academic level, and yet I still went down that road and it was just this this need to kind of feel like I was, I don't know, like I had something to offer. And when I did the piano performances, it provided that in abundance. You know, here I was, here was me, the freak, the loser, whatever, standing up, playing the piano for people like a thousand, if not more, in the theatres. And I wow. even got to the opera house in England and it was it was insane. I met the Queen all this kind of stuff. I mean, it was really good. It was really successful. And I would have this, like this buzz when I was on stage because the best way I can describe it is kind of like it gave me a, a validation. It made me feel that I could have a use or a value. And in that respect, it was good. And people would say to me, well, that must give you confidence, right? You know, you're doing this and you're having all this applause at the end and all this adulation for it. And that was true, but the come down after that was phenomenal. And I remember when I played the Opera House in Blackpool and I was 
I was the headlining act. I had my own dressing room. I wow. even remember wow. to kind of give to give you a to paint the picture of the level it was. I even went to the to the theatre and they said, "Oh, Mr. Sands, would you like to have a go on the piano? You know, like rehearse on it." And I said, "Oh, yeah, I'll definitely need to do that." And they said, um, "Well, here it is." And I went to sit down on the piano stool and they got this stage kid, a helper from the side and said, oh, can you clean the stool for Mr. Sands first? Well, they had That's... to they made this guy clean. The and I was like, it's just a freaking stool. I don't care. But um, you know, <laughs> they, <were> kind of, <laughs> they thought it was obviously that important. So it was um, it was very good work. But yeah, yeah. but yeah, yeah, I would come off the stage and in the moment where I was doing the performance and, you know, there's all this applause, it was great. The moment I came off, the the downward spiral was horrendous. And mm. I left that stage and then I was back to being freak Michael with no life. You know, I, I didn't think I had any value at all. So that ended up being like a hamster wheel. I was just doing one performance after the other because I needed this feeling of val validation. But then at the same time, I'd have this tremendous come down so it just went round and round and round in circles it was awful um so i did that for quite a few years i ended up being a cocktail pianist at a cocktail bar in london which was yeah. great um it had the same kind of feel in the sense that you always had this validation aspect and that i can't begin to describe david was so so important to me because it was always about trying to find my place trying to find a value because although I was still going to church and I had a I had a strong faith in, in some ways, it wasn't being, I wasn't thinking about it in the right way. And it was going through the motions. Now, I would go to church, I would say my prayers, but nothing was altering how I was as a person, how I felt inside, how I thought people saw me. All of that right. was just completely twisted. Mm -hmm. So I went on like that for a number of years. And then I made a load more mistakes along the way, trust me. I mean, it was it was a real mess. And then I can't remember. I don't think there necessarily was one thing in particular, but I got to a stage where I was really unwell. And it was so bad that my health was even affected. I started not sleeping. I was losing weight. I couldn't face eating. I mean, it was really... I mean, I guess the only good thing to come out of this part of the story is that I lost a few pounds. Um, mm. But it was starting to become noticeable to other people. I mean, I remember my co-workers at the time saying to me, like, what's wrong with you? Because I'd always been super professional, I was good at my job, but they started to notice that I wasn't able to focus, that it was just badly going wrong. And then around that time was just, I reached the end of the road. And on this one day in particular, when I, I just, I don't know, I broke. It was like that was it. There was just there was nothing else to come. And anyone who knows me knows that I'm quite a reserved person. I'm typically English in my manner. Uh, and so for me to to do this was quite unusual. But I was really, really I mean, when I broke, I broke. And I was crying like a baby on the floor for probably a couple of hours. I mean, I was it's like it just imploded in one go. It was pretty extreme. And George and you're how old? You're how old at this point? I would have been twenty-one. Twenty-one. Okay. Twenty-one. So I was in this situation on the floor, it floods of tears, and and all of this, and I cried out. I absolutely cried out to God, and I didn't know what I wanted to ask Him. I didn't know what I needed. I just remember saying something to the effect of, "Please save me, and save me from this." and let me know you're there. And you know, it would be nice to sit here and say during you know, my testimony that I heard a booming voice from heaven and everything changed right. immediately. It didn't, yeah. but I did have a peace come over me and I said straight away um, and it was immediate. You know, it was this kind of, the only way I could put it really is that there was a peace. And so I started crying and thought, well, that's what I've done wrong. I thought, you idiot, Michael, you know, you were raised with faith. You know that God's there. It's a strength. It's a tool to be used. And I hadn't done that. And I knew that I drifted far away from my faith, that God had become distant, that I hadn't worked at anything at all to keep my faith alive. And, and that really came apparent so quickly when, and when I was in that moment. 
Um, by the way, I do apologize. Apologize, my voice shakes. It's absolutely freezing here. So no, <laughs> man, you're good. I'm I mean, I really, my shakes. No, I was um, gonna say. I was gonna say though that you you knew that God was there with you when you cried out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There was no question. As I said it, I didn't feel anything. But the moment the words were out of my lips, um, there was a peace that came over me, and I knew then that yes, this was what I finally asked of him was what I needed to ask right from the very start. But I was mm-hmm. just too wrapped up in it to mm-hmm. think about it. Yeah. So, yeah. So I stopped uh, the tears, and I thought, okay, I've got to get back to my faith, back to God, and back to where I need to be. I didn't expect to change. I didn't think my problems would go away. I was very realistic in that way. I just thought faith is the only thing I've got. I had nothing else, you know what I mean? Okay, I've done some successful music work, but that was just almost like, you know, a career. It's just a job. Um, it was something I enjoyed, but it was it was not, yeah, it wasn't fulfilling in any way. It didn't fill a void. You were searching for something so much deeper. I'm, was i was um i was searching for happiness and as we all know that is not possible in the world so i cried out to god and he obviously gave me this peace and it was the only way i could describe this is like kind of like a light bulb going off in my head i sat there and i I thought like what have i done i need god i need him so completely and utterly that this is like whole next level i'm not going to get this just from going to the local church and like a light bulb in my head, I thought, I need Jesus so much in my life. This, I, need, I need to be saved from the Savior. And then in my head, it kind of all happened in a split second. I thought, and I can. I thought, I can receive Jesus, but the only place I can receive him is the Catholic Church. Because my brain went back to my school days, and I wasn't listening in the last lessons half the time i admit i was but this is this is like that moment of crying out to god yes then the next thought process is i can receive jesus in the catholic church absolutely and it was this feeling yeah (laughs) okay keep talking (laughs) it was wow i was i was sat there thinking i need i need such a closeness such closeness I, I need to receive jesus and the only place i can do that is the catholic church and i remembered that from my schooling so i basically this happened on i think it was a friday and i went to mass on the sunday now i always think this is strange i presume a priest would probably tell me it's not strange it's per- i went up to the priest after mass and i said to him father i need to be catholic and he he never asked me anything. He never asked me why. He never asked me if I had a religious background. He never asked me what led to my decision that I wanted to be Catholic. There was nothing. Yeah. He just said, can you give me a telephone number and I'll get someone to call you. Now, I had the phone call a couple of days later, and it was by wonderful, well, it wasn't a coincidence, I realize now, but it was my old high, high school uh, religious education teacher. And Did the priest know that you knew this person? No. No, what he didn't. he didn't and the odd thing was there are two parishes in my town and the woman he asked actually attended the other parish so it was definitely meant to be <laughs> it was a it was a great thing to happen the only downside with it was that, of course typical teacher she assumed that i had listened to everything and she said oh don't worry about this mark well you don't need these lessons you know all this was i taught you <laughs> And I didn't have the confidence to say, well, actually, Mrs. White, I listened to nothing um, at school. I just sort of said, oh, yes, yeah, you did. Yeah. And uh, you were great. And I, yeah. Great I teacher. It. Yeah. So, so I kind of went along with it. And to be fair, I knew a lot of it um, just because I'd been raised religious. So some of the stuff that's covered in the course right. is, um, you know, basic. So ultimately, I ended up having two sessions with her. So I was being received into the church and I had two lessons which is trust me not enough um but there was one thing that I just couldn't get my head around I was so protestant I could not get my head around the role of our lady Mm. and I kept thinking because I remembered in my school days the Hail Mary and you know all Mary and stuff and I kept thinking how on earth am I going to do this because this is a major part Catholicism I just don't get it I don't get why is she intercedes? I don't get her role. I don't even get what the deal is about Mary. Couldn't understand it. 
and I was researching, I was looking at books and YouTube videos and everything. I was speaking to people and trying to get this, this testimony of Our Lady, if that kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. And um, what happened was, uh, I'm pretty ashamed to admit this though, but I'm going to have to say it. I got to the stage where I thought, you know what, I'm never going to understand this, so I'll just pretend I do. Um, which I'm not proud of myself for saying, but I'm not going to sit and lie. Um, now, I was due to be received into the church. This was, it was the day before. So this was all happening on the day before, what I'm about to say next. And so I'd got to this point in about one week before I decided I was just going to act to the part. I was going to pretend to understand it and just go through the motions mm -hmm. because I knew I needed to be Catholic to receive Jesus. Well, the day before I was received into the church, I, and I, at this point, I had exhausted every possible YouTube video, every book, every everything on Our Lady. I'd exhausted the lot. And but, at this point, it just wasn't connecting for you? No, like, based on just, what you, okay. Not at all. No. Okay. But the day before I was received, I thought, I'm going to have a look at YouTube just one more time, just to satisfy myself, just to re-go over it. On that day, I found a video. I've never been able to find it since. It was a priest who was talking about how he became a priest and his personal experience with Our Lady. It was mm. a very, very um, powerful testimony. It was the words that she said to him that I knew on that day I was meant to hear. And I tell people on the occasions that I've been asked about Mary by perhaps Protestant friends or indeed anyone, and he, he said to her, because he'd been a very, very bad person, he'd done a lot of bad, and he said to Our Lady, how can someone like me love you? How, how can I be enough? You know, like was, because he had this experience with Our Lady. Mm -hmm. But the words she said to him were the words that I was meant to hear that day. And her response was, you don't have to change to love me. Loving me will change you. And... The moment I heard that, and this still gives me like, you know, tingles down my spine. Yeah. The moment I heard that, everything changed. Wow. Wow. My real conversion didn't happen on the day I cried out to God. It put the wheels in motion. The real part of the conversion was hearing those words. And that changed me. But yeah, I can, I can feel the presence, like as you're saying that, you know, like. Yeah. <laughs> it was like. She didn't need to appear to me that day. Um, in this day and age, the internet's as good as anything. <laughs> that was how that message was delivered to me. I right. am, and she, that was how it was sent to me. And translation, I, the evangelization is important on social media. So there yeah. we go. <laughs> Amen to that. Absolutely. <laughs> and um, a friend of mine has given me a set of rosary, rosary beads because, of course, growing up Protestant, I didn't own rosaries. And no one was buying me presents for me being received into the church because I was abandoning my family faith. So mm. it wasn't something to be exactly celebrated. So thankfully, somebody had given me uh, some rosary beads a couple of weeks before. And so I heard these words from Malaysia and I got down on my knees and I prayed the rosary. I'm quite certain I didn't do it right, but I <laughs> prayed my version of the rosary. For the first time. Yeah, exactly. And I'm quite yeah. certain our lady didn't hold that against me. But um, <laughs> that was, again, it's very difficult to use kind of earthly words or expressions to put this into context but the only way i can describe it or that i think it it is is that mary was the one who really opened my heart before that i had been on the right path after i knew that i had to be catholic but it was still a very kind of um not academic thing but it was just going through the motions to get to that point it was the experience with her that changed me as a person. And it was the experience of her that made me no longer think about my problems or the problems I'd had with people or acceptance or validation. Suddenly it was like, it, it was like she changed my heart to think, yes, loving Mary, having devotion to her will draw me closer to Jesus. I will be receiving Jesus in the church each week. And therefore, that is sufficient. I don't need anything in the world to give me any validation. I've got the best of the best here. And it yeah. kind of gave yeah. me, sounds pretty cheesy to say this, I suppose, but you've got to remember, I didn't have any 
any kind of validation for myself. You know, it's different mm. if I've been in a relationship and someone's telling you every day that they love you or whatever, you know. Um, not that many people in relationships will be telling their partners they love them every day, but you know what I mean? You have that kind of natural validation just from being with someone who, who does love you. And I think for me, it was the first time that I really felt acceptance. Mm. And I knew that, I knew from the experience that I went through that she, she truly was leading me to the church. And you know what? It's so crazy you say that because I actually was having this image of you almost as like a little boy and Our Lady like taking you by the hand and like walking yeah. you home. But the image, the image was actually like the church, you know, like taking you right to Jesus. Yeah, it was. And I often have described it to people. That's how I always describe it and say it was just like she took me by the hand and walk, walked me to wow. the church. And that was the next day. Wow. Um, and so me as a Catholic now. I do have a particular devotion to Our Lady because it was thanks to her that I, that I changed. And I always say to people that I didn't decide to convert. People perhaps who have converted have different stories and different you know, experiences. But with me, I, I really do believe I was called to the Catholic Church. And so for me to have not become Catholic would have been like a, a, somebody who feels the call to priesthood, you decides not to do it. You are actually saying no to God. That is a big deal. So I remember thinking, and it, it kind of makes me laugh to this day because I'm not in a disrespectful way, but I kind of jokingly have thought in my prayers before, kind of ask God, is this almost like a joke, you know, calling me to the most family orientated church on the planet when I haven't got kids, I'm not married, you know, whatever. But I was called, called to the Catholic Church and I, I knew I was being called. And I accepted the call completely and utterly. And Our Lady was the kind of clincher in that. That was the final thing that bound it all together mm. and has been the sustaining force since I did convert. And going from the place that I was at, and I would say that I was at that stage right up until the moment I actually was received. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Going from that place, um, Perhaps people who know me wouldn't have been aware of all of the, the changes, but I mean, I can only sit here and give a testimony today that, I mean, I wouldn't be doing this if I was in the position I was at before. Yeah. My conversion and understanding identity in Christ literally changed my life overnight. And, you know, we've all read books and we've seen testimonies. And if anyone's like me, I tend to used to think, oh, that's really nice to happen for them. It would never happen for me. Um, it's a nice idea. And I believed it. I believed in the power that Jesus could have on someone's life or that Mary could, you know, have. But I never really thought it would ever happen to me. Um, and now I do sit here and I am proof that it does happen and can happen. And yeah. I haven't done justice during this to give you a real indication of the state that I was in, but suffice to say, I was a total mess and I had zero, zero confidence or esteem in myself. Mm. And it got taken away. Um, it wasn't anything changed particularly. It was just a sudden realization of who I was in Christ. Wow. Yeah, man, it's just amazing hearing your story. I mean, God is God's grace is literally all over it. And I just love how today's gospel, I made a post earlier just about how Emmanuel means God is with us. Mm. And in that moment of total despair and just crying out saying, Lord, save me. Yeah. Makes me think of St. Peter, you know, crying out when he was, he was basically sinking and the, yeah. the Lord just reached out his hand and said, why did you doubt, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that really interests me, having gone through this myself, is that it's so unique to each person. I mean, it, it, I think truly, if, if God had said to me before that, well, Michael, tell me, how, how would you like your life to change? How would you like to be saved? I would have come out with the most worldly answer in history. You know, it would have been, well, if you can, you know, make me more popular, please. And if I can, you know, get married next year, that be great and if i can be blessed with it i would have gone down the things that i was so hung up about um never in a million years and beyond would i have thought that the answer to those de desires the prayers would be called to a, a church called to the mm. Catholic church i mean 
as I said in my um, link, uh, my bio on when you advertise this kind of session today, yeah. when I was at the Catholic school, I mean, never, ever did conversion enter my head. I mean, it never did. It never. And some people would say, oh, well, surely it did because you were at a Catholic school. No, I was, I was raised Church of England, Protestant, Anglican. You know, sure. I didn't have any. I believed in God and I said my prayers and I had a faith, but I never thought I was going to be Catholic because I didn't have any Catholic family to turn to. You know, it, it didn't make any sense. But my calling to the Catholic Church was my was the the saving grace that changed my life, and so yeah. I owe everything to that. Yeah, I just think that moment, like how literally you feel this peace, and then have this thought about receiving Jesus, like, man, that's obviously just a a moment of, of grace right there. It was. Like, yeah, I mean, you saw my reaction, right? I was like, wait a second, what? <laughs> like, yeah. peace of, boom. Like, it was like, wow. Yeah, there, there were, I mean, as I say, you, you know, I'll get off this um, this call and, and I'll think of a million more things I wish I could have said. But that's, yeah, that for me was the, the, the biggest part of it. It, it was it was those right from the moment I called out to God to save me, to the moment that I had the experience with Our Lady and really was walked to the church, mm -hmm. um, in, and that all happened in the space of about two weeks, from where I called out to the because I, as I said I didn't have any lessons before I became Catholic right. because she thought I knew it all and the <laughs> priest didn't challenge her he just said oh oh okay so you knew him yeah he was one of my pupils my students and right. so he was like great get him straight in <laughs> so um i didn't have any chance to learn anything but again to me that was proof that god didn't hang around mm. and i when i wanted him to save me i i, I seem to think I, I said you know like now as we're all impatient as humans we want it and we want it now yeah and i think i kind of smiled because god's got a great sense of humor and i think well it couldn't have been quicker it literally couldn't have been quicker i know people at my parish who have converted and they sit and tell me all these stories about like you know they went through a year-long course or this oh, CIA. Well, mine was two weeks <laughs> but that was how much god knew that i needed to be there to save me and yeah. it, praise the lord that he saw something worth saving that i was you know that was uh in a way him reiterating yeah sort of taking away the doubts that i had because i didn't want to live you know i wasn't that i ever considered suicide but i had no desire to live i mean i just saw nothing it was a blank canvas and he in the best way possible showed me that it's kind of you know think again michael you're a child of mine you are loved you, you've got a purpose and this is where i want you to be and i've never looked back since man so awesome just so good uh speaking of uh, Marian dogma and the Eucharist and whatnot. Someone did actually ask that as a question. I don't know if you want to add anything to it, but they basically said, what was harder to accept Marian dogmas or the Eucharist being Jesus and why? I think you spoke to it pretty well, but yeah, 110% it was the Marian dogmas. Yeah. Um, funnily enough, a lot of Anglicans do struggle with the literal presence of, of Christ in the Eucharist. I never did. I, I think I had, I, I can be quite a black and white person at times. And I think for me, it was just as simple as, well, the scriptures doesn't, you know, they don't say this is in, you know, representing my body and blood. It just says, this is my blood. This, this is my blood. body. So I never really struggled with that. And it kind of made sense because when I grew up Anglican, they'd be doing the same stuff that happens at mass. So you see all this build up to the Eucharist and the, you know, the vicar as they're called, not the priest holding the host up. And once I've been to Catholic school, I was like, okay, now this makes more sense that the mass is driven towards that moment in an mm. Anglican church. I was like, well, nothing's ha happening. It's just a piece of bread. And just to come So it's all symbolic. It's not particularly, it didn't make any sense to me. So the, the Eucharist was never an issue for me, but the Marian dogmas, my gosh, they were impossible for me to understand. And that was, if I were sent now to evangelize to Anglicans, I would always begin by uh, the Marian stuff. That's yeah, a absolutely. real big deal for uh, Protestants. Yeah. And you have no idea who the priest was that you were able to watch the, the video of his story? Yes, I do. It was somebody called Donald Cameron. I knew it! Mm. Okay, yes. But, <laughs> I was like, it's Father Donald Calloway as you're talking. It, it was, but the weird thing is, is Father Calloway has 
on multiple occasions shared his testimony but the one i saw okay. was like two hours long and all the others go through the thing where he says you know that he was involved in you know drugs and whatever okay had this experience with mary and moves yeah. on this particular one he went into great depth a lot of detail yeah yeah and i've never found it since. see i i'm pretty sure i heard him share his story on like a catholic lighthouse media mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. uh recording kind of thing probably yeah. not the same one if it was that long because i don't think it was two hours but you yeah, gotta find this video just for he, sh he shared some pretty um amazing stuff and in this particular one it was all to do with um a book that he had read just before he had this out-of-body experience yeah. and he cried out to mary and yeah. mary came to him and it was kind of now when i look back all of it so well it was god's hand mm. it? you know him crying out to somebody and i just cried out to god and a week later i found that video and so i understood i think it was with father calloway's testimony and story it bore so much resemblance not that i had done the same things that he had done you know i had other problems but i think how it resolved with him being called to the catholic church and albeit a different vocation but it was that kind of yeah like under an, an understanding of of the process that he went mm. through mm. and it really spoke to my heart and i knew 100 percent um and it's interesting my now parish priest doesn't believe me when i say this but i know that um on that evening particularly, I really did feel that Our Lady was with me. I mean, I, I would say that to my dying, dying day. I mean, she was there with me. I well, and what's amazing, too, is you even acknowledge while you're sharing your story that you even experienced his presence right in that moment of telling that moment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so many people and so beautiful. many Catholics, unfortunately, some people don't have perhaps as, you know, as open a mind to certain elements of the faith. But I can't deny it, you know, I, and even if people were to make fun of me for that or laugh about it or criticize or not believe it, I'm kind of duty bound to share that because yes. I know it to be true. I went through it. She was there yeah. and she walked me um, to that church. And as I say, that was the biggest change I went through. It was a total conversion of my heart completely and utterly. Mm. It's amazing, man. That's so awesome. Um, Another question that kind of came in earlier in the week was, how do you get peace in your heart? Any thoughts there, Michael? Well, um, yeah, this is, a, this is a great question because trust me, I, I wrote the book on having no peace in the heart mm -hmm. at all for mm -hmm. many, many years. Mm -hmm. I would encourage anyone with any kind of problem of, of any kind, really. Uh, I think most people have have things that bother them greatly. To me, one of the biggest issues a person can have is if they don't understand their identity in Christ. And I have read that expression so many times in my earlier years, when I was going through all the negative stuff that I went through. And again, I believed it, you know, I believed that some people had experienced that. But the huge human in me and the very worldly aspect he used to think well that's great i know jesus loves me i was taught that as a child but that's not enough you know it's not enough just to think well jesus loves me you know that's awful for me to admit but again i'm not gonna lie that's what, how i used to feel like well great okay you tell me something i don't know you know jesus loves well, me. well and to be fair i mean if you if you just know it here it's got to actually take the journey yeah. to the head and the heart right yeah yeah exactly um but again, when I went through my conversion was when my heart was changed. And that for the first time is when I understood that it truly, and I use that word first, truly didn't matter what the world thought of me. It truly didn't matter whether I was popular with people. It didn't matter what I looked like. It didn't matter if I was married or single. None of it mattered mm. because I was God's child, created in his image and loved by him. Right. And I really believe, and I testify to that, that if you have a true understanding of your identity in Christ, a whole load of your problems walk straight out the door, and a peace comes into your heart that truly does surpass all understanding. Well said. Yeah. Very, very true. Okay, what is your favorite part of being an organist for the church? And I'm pretty sure uh, the person that submitted this is actually a full-time organist for the church 
much as well. So, well, um, uh, one thing I will say, and I always say this to everyone, is that I was a trained pianist. I'm a self-taught organist. So, whoever the person is, please know I'm not. I don't profess to be an organist. As okay. Well. Um, right. I, I do my bit. I I do at it. Um, <laughs> One of the things I introduced when I was asked to take over um, playing the organ, again, this is another thing with God's hand um, in it. Okay. Um, when I joined the church, they had somebody who was playing, and that person suddenly left um, without any warning at all, just up and went. And someone, I mean, no one knew me at the church. You've got to remember, I wasn't raised in it. No one knew me, no family were there. Yeah. But someone said, I think the guy at the back plays, and I think I'd talked to someone the week before or something. So I had this frantic um, conversation with the music director saying, please, can you cover the music? Please, you know, please tell us that you're confident enough to play for a congregation. And I was like, well, absolutely, because I used to um, do piano shows. Right. So I took over. But one of the things that I asked to be introduced was that I would continue to play until the last person had left the church. Because they used to just do the last hymn and that was it. And at first, so I just think, oh, maybe this is overkill. Like, am I being judged for this? You know, I'm, is it ruining everything? But a woman came up to me and said, and I'd seen her face because the organ has a mirror so that I can see the altar and see what's happening. Oh, okay. Mass. So I could always see her face and she always sat on the front row. And I noticed before that she would always stay after mass. And then one day she came up and she said to me, I just want to say thank you for always continuing to play until I leave. And I said, well, that's very kind of you. Thank you very much. And she said, no, I mean it. She said, because I always finish Mass and then I have time with the Lord myself for a while while I sit and pray. And she said, your music just enhances the time with the Lord so much. And that to me was the nicest compliment and biggest, um, just the warmest feeling to know that if nothing else, you can bring some extra dimension to the Mass or to how somebody feels. You know, so many people find music as a, as a therapy or, mm -hmm. yeah, it kind of enhances it somehow. And to be able to contribute to someone's spirituality in that way, however small, is beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Uh, okay, last question of the night. Who is your favorite saint and why? My goodness, there are so many. Right. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'd love to sit here and say someone like, you know, Padre Pio. I've got to be honest, I think meeting Padre Pio would be terrifying because he was so... You can read your soul, yeah, right? Which, which I've got to be honest, I mean, I've been Catholic for a long time, but I'm not quite ready to have someone read my, you know, read my, <laughs> my thoughts and my soul. Um, I'm going to say St. Teresa of Calcutta. Okay. And the reason I say that is because this was a person that I already respected and liked before, long before I was Catholic. Right. And she became a saint in my lifetime. I can yes. truthfully say I have seen someone on television and admired them and watched them go from someone tremendously important to literally a saint. Uh, and I think there are so many saints we can admire, but I've got to be honest, there's something unique and extremely special about actually remembering that the person mm. in the world and seeing them become a saint. I think that is so powerful. Yeah. And, uh, I always admired her work very much. Um, it's simple things like her quotes on things. Um, she just had a true devotion to the poor. Yes. And I think as somebody who came from what I really consider complete and utter outs the the outside of normality the outside of society I, and that's how i felt and so in some bizarre sense i identify with that the fact that she, she was there for people who didn't fit the social norm who weren't you know the people people that everyone loved is very powerful to mm -hmm. me so mm -hmm. for all of those reasons i've got to say saint Teresa of calcutta you know, we're not too far off in age and actually it gave me a little bit of a flashback being at my grandma's house and even seeing her funeral and remembering her in real life, you know, yeah, and yeah. the things that she would say as a kid, right? Like you, you just kind of grew up knowing her as a modern day saint in the making, right? And as you said, like to be able yeah. to witness her become an actual saint, it's... Oh it's, yeah, it's, it's awesome. And I mean, I never had any kind of statues of 
of the saints like a lot of catholics do and it's sure. like, but i'm still playing catch up like you know 16 years later but when i was on vacation this summer uh, with a friend of mine in texas and he actually yeah. bought me a statue of saint Teresa of california oh no way which I love, and it's taken pride of place uh, on my fireplace because it's um it has special significance definitely that's awesome man well on that note, I just want to thank you so much for your yes uh, to Jesus and his church, man. And just really appreciate you taking the time to to share, you know, your vulnerabilities and the challenges that you've been through. But God's grace is obviously moving uh, throughout your life and just humbled that you take the time to be able to, to share your story tonight. So thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. That's awesome. Would you be able to uh, close us in prayer tonight? Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, we're really grateful for the time that we spent this evening discussing the power that your Spirit has in our lives. Lord, we pray that anyone who is experiencing negative thoughts, self-hatred, shame, guilt, all the things that the enemy uses against so many of us, Lord, we pray that they will truly understand who they are in you, their value, their worth, the love that you have for all of us. And we really pray that your spirit will guide them towards you and the true church here on earth. And I ask this through Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the ministry, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or please leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest stories, you can follow us on Instagram at yes.catholic and visit our website, yescatholic.com. If you have benefited from Yes Catholic, please consider joining our Patreon community. Visit patreon.com slash yescatholic. I would like to thank our current patrons for your ongoing prayers, support, and contributions that have helped Yes Catholic reach thousands of souls all over the world each week. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you. You have a story. Don't be afraid to share the good news of how Jesus Christ has moved in your life with a family member, friend, or colleague. Give Jesus your yes every single day and watch the ripple effect of the gospel. Join us next week. The journey continues right here at Yes Catholic.